Um, now, Alex is a relatively new member of Sarah, but when he presented at the Drake's Lounge, we got multiple requests for him to, to uh, do a presentation for the annual conference. So uh, uh, he's a, uh, that that is totally unusual, and uh, he made such a good impression with the Drake Lounge people that he is uh, he uh, put together a brief, and uh, here he is. So uh, 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 one second, let me let me give you a, a good good intro here. And then um, everybody, turn on their uh, turn off their mute or turn uh, mute their signal there. Okay. So he received a he went to Clemson University, a degree in physics. Uh, he uh, worked for Lockheed Martin, uh, Supervisor Dynamics Test Instrumentation Analysis Group. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Central Florida, um, and he's got a lab that uh, experimental mechanics dynamics analysis lab, and he's an extra class ham. Uh, he's also a member of the Central Florida Astronomical Society in Lake Monroe, amateur radio astronomy, and he's also got Sarah as is one of his uh, uh, important groups that he's a member of. Um, Alex, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Actually, Lockheed Martin and UCF are all retired, but that was, let me see something here. <laughs> let me see if I can get this started. Share. Let's see. Can we see it? I don't know. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. All right. So what I wanted to do um, is go through a, a fairly basic uh, presentation on using this small one meter telescope and um, hopefully give some information that might be useful for beginners and um, beginners. I just looked uh, back and I didn't even purchase the, uh, the dish until I ordered it August 11th last year. So this has been pretty much a crash course and and a steep up the slope of uh, Wolfgang's education. Um, I realize that a, a small reflector has limited sensitivity and uh, you have limited spatial resolution, but the real goal was to create a lightweight setup that I could move around for offsite demonstrations. And it has met that goal. And so um, I'm gonna pass on the overview. Uh, Ed Hartman did a real good job on that. So. I want to go through the steps that um, basically maybe uh, new slides or other types of, of information on the hardware software, drift scan, data recording, and the hardware upgrades that I had employed and uh, processing via uh, Excel and a few math work scripts that I put together. So um, this was the basic system that you can buy off the shelf and this is what I put together last fall. Um, it, it fit a small Celestron CG11 CG4 mount. And this was really advantageous for quick setups, especially field setups. And I'll show you how that works later on. But basically uh, just a, a, a Lesmondi V plate with a counterbalance weight allowed it for easy and accurate positioning. And this was the basic telescope configuration with the dipole. Um, and this is the original hardware. What I did was, because I did this all prior to even knowing that uh, uh, Sarah existed, was I purchased the 1.7 gig antenna. And it is different. The boom is slightly longer and the reflector is slightly bigger. So it in itself may have slightly better gain than the 2.4 gig Wi-Fi configuration. I'm not sure. But I would recommend everyone start with this because it has known properties and it does all work. And then venture out from there because at least you can establish a baseline of how this stuff all works together. And so the process being, and then the antenna reflector acting pretty much like an optical uh, reflector telescope where instead of your eye or camera is an antenna. The Sawbird, this thing is, is wonderful for 40 bucks. I can't believe it's that inexpensive. It's a low noise amplifier, a bandpass filter centered on the, uh, if you get the H1, 
for the hydrogen band and at a post amp give you about 40 dB of amplification into this SDR, which is an analog to digital converter, PC control. And paralleling with that is if you want off the shelf, it, you're, you're committed to AirSpy uh, SDR Studio because it has this IF average package. And these are, uh, this is a, I would have had a difficult challenge going through and trying to create software in another environment. This is a nice team. Um, the, uh, hold on a second. Sorry about that. So the software package is the F, uh, SDR AirSpy, SDR Sharp Studio, and the IF Average plugin for acquisition and finding where you are in the sky. Stellarium, another free software program, is is really nice. So these this is probably the basic software configuration that will allow you to get started, find where you are, and allow you to take data. Um, thought this was kind of an interesting comparison. Um, those of you in the amateur radio world familiar with SDR radio displays in the 20 meter band, where you have lots of individual frequencies, you want to select one, you might narrow band filter a particular band for, for listening or recording. In contrast to that, going up to the 1400 megahertz band, your signal looks like this as a composed of these narrow uh, bands over here, and you want to save the entire bandwidth. You don't tune in the frequency, you allow the software to stay fixed. Also take a look at this. These are filter ripples, I believe, in the, um, the, the, the filter processing creates uh, ripples in the band. So let's take a look at this. This is the uh, SDR AirSpy Studio. Uh, and I want to emphasize and show what the IF average does. And that it, it has its own control panel over here. Um, and there are certain features that are associated with this. One, the first is averaging. Um, for this antenna, being that it's fairly broad, physically broad, uh, 512 averages is fine. So setting an FFT to 512 is fine. The intermediate and the dynamic slider determine the number of averages you can save. Um, the system's running around 3,000 averages a second. So a couple hundred thousand averages will give you a minute, about a million, about a million samples per five minutes. Um, oh, go back here one more second. These sliders here determine what you see on the display. For displaying the data, I've always left this level set at 1,000 and just moved this gain up and down so you can physically see something. And as Charles said in the past, these labels are kind of strange. But I've never used this other than just for uh, qualitative analysis to see that I have a signal level there. Although this display is kind of strange, the data is correct, the data that is stored. Um, these allow you to start stop acquisition. Uh, this is probably, this is one of the key buttons here is background. This allows you to subtract a reference background to correct the data file. And just to show you the effect of this, this is the, spe this is the spectrum using a background correction file. And I'll show you how I determine that. Without that, this is what the data would look like. You can hardly even, even though this is a strong signal, it's totally corrupted by this, by this ripple. I guess this is due to narrowband digital filtering. Anyhow, moving along. The bottom portion here allows you to specify a path and a file name, the number of files to save. I've never used a delay between samples, but you just set this up and this toggles between start and stop. Start multiple save and it will create 
text data files. And it will, it will sequentially number the files. So you set the primary file number and it will sequentially label these. Um, and I wrote a MATLAB script that will just go in and grab a sequential number of, of labeled files. So this process works really well. The, uh, the data is stored. These are linear units. And so you have frequency amplitude pairs that even with Excel, you can plot. So you wind up with some RFI noise. That was a big challenge for about eight months. Um, cold sky and system noise and your hydrogen signal. And over here, I have been converting the amplitude to a dB scale. And the correct equation for this is uh, 20 times the log 10 of this data, plus an offset. Uh, without this offset, these numbers, the, the decibel values, maybe mine is 87 or 90. Don't know what that means, but it's, they're very small numbers. You just pick an offset, offset the entire set of data to plus 85 or something like that, whatever is required to start this at zero. So if you're doing this in Excel, that's, it's a little bit of a tedious process, but you can offset and set the background level to zero, and you can see what your signal level is relative to the background noise. Data acquisition. Um, I was using Marcus's um, intensity map. It had, it, this was very useful. I think I added some extra hour, hour increments to it, but this was Stellarium is a nice combination in that it allows you to see what is up in the sky, where the intense areas are and the number of hours in advance or plus or minus overhead of where it is that you might want to begin acquisition. And I have always used drift scans. So I typically start pointing the antenna to the west and allow the sky to drift by. Equatorial mount is really nice because I set it up every time. This is and, and for field use, it's also great. Set in the hour angle and the declination. And so this helps you set up your telescope the way the, to position it properly to the uh, equatorial display in Stellarium. And the way you do this is you set this to north. I go out at night or use a compass and set up find true north, add the variation, and you can set this to true north, set in the elevation appropriate for your latitude, and then this bubble level will help you position the antenna to overhead, dial in the declination that you want, level it, set this, this rotatable dial to what's overhead, whatever the hour angle is now, and if you want two and a half hours later, you just rotate the, the antenna dish for two and a half. So the, the, the equatorial type mount works very well for quick setups. Drift scans. Drift scans are pretty easy. Um, I said I've only been doing this for less than a year, and I don't have, I haven't even attempted to try to go through and set up any kind of software to drive the, the telescope. Um, I don't know if the stepper motors are going to create more RFI. I have been through a lot with trying to get RFI suppressed. And so I'm happy to minimize the amount of, of active um, electrical devices around the telescope. So you just point to a position and every so often, and you continuously take data, but you are saving data at this rate. And so you develop a series of plots and you can, so you interrogate, you save a sample of data over a particular range of um, the sky. And um, this is an example of uh, two hours, two hour scan, five minute samples um, at declination zero. And so you can see there is some changing 
in amplitudes and frequency content. And I, I was just amazed last year that in, this is a five minute is 1.25 degrees of sky change that you could actually see something with the broad field of view of the small one meter reflector telescope that you could uh, see anything in the sky change that dramatically in five minutes. So hardware level upgrade number one was, um, I had actually started building this antenna before I even got the parabolic reflector because I didn't know what was out there at the time until I found Sarah. So I had built this before I even found the reflector dish. And um, I didn't spend a lot of time evaluating this because this was already completed. But as, a, as an early example, there is definitely an improvement in, in amplitude. Um, and so I did go back and forth a few times, but basically since this was built, I optimized the positioning of this and just carried on. And so some of the steps along the way may have been in a, based on a guess rather than long experimentation, but I was trying to, it's really hard, it's very hard to get started. It's really, the problem in the beginning is not even knowing what questions to ask. That's, that's the biggest challenge, crawling up that steep mountain. So this is what I built. And it was a, a variation of the OM6AA's antenna. He built a dual loop uh, configuration for 13 and 23 centimeters. And um, I, I used that as a two point scaling and came up with this. Uh, the length is 21 centimeters. The cylinder, um, the, the choke is five inches, 120 millimeters in diameter. And I've got some scaling. It's about 30, 34 millimeters deep. And it works. It's a heavy double-sided G10 circuit uh, pre -C board for the bottom, a ring of brass, and a lot of soldering. I made this. I turned this on my lathe. There was a lot of manual labor that, that went into this. Um, and this is the original combination. Whoops, this is the original combination. Um, after looking at this in the granularity of, a, of an 8-bit system, I went and I bought an AirSpy Mini for a hundred bucks and doing comparison, you can see the difference in resolution. So it may be okay to start with this, but for another 50, 60 bucks more, the 12 bit resolution of this uh, AirSpy Mini is observable. There are a lot of other very inexpensive variations. GPIO Labs makes a whole family of things that you, that you can uh, try. I have a few of them. I bought a lot more than I think I ever even tested, but they have uh, they have an H1 filter um, and they have some varieties of, of amplifiers and they're they're sufficiently inexpensive that you can try combinations. But like I said, I would start with this. You know, it works. Get this working and then move on. Uh, what I did wind up doing was from someone's recommendation on uh, the Sarah group was getting the, a Tom Henderson uh, system. Is it worth 10 times the price of the, um, the Saltberg? No, probably not, but it looks, it, it looks impressive. And the, and, and the specifications are, are pretty good. I think that one has a, let's see, has a noise factor of 0.26. So there is the, the LNA, about a meter of um, LMR 400 down to a cavity filter, and then another 13 dB wide amplifier, wide band amplifier that has a noise factor of 0.7. Um, there's a, this is cluttered because at the time I had the, I had the, uh, the SDR up here, I had the LNA, uh, the sawbird up here, and so I could switch back and forth between these. So this was in the, the early testing stages that I could switch back. Having the SDR here, I could switch back from the, the Tom Henderson system up to the uh, no electric sawbird and back and forth. And at this time, I was using a 12 volt supply at the, uh, the antenna for the Henderson hardware. That's, that was 12 volts.
Um, this is when you have something of this scale, you have the ability to access the feed point, not necessarily so easy with the uh, a larger dish. But this was what I started using for the uh, the hot reference for calibration, background calibration, and it's the just a stack of electrically conductive foam in this Tupperware container. And I slide it over there and you can use that to run the background calibration of the, for the IF average software. And it provides a nice flat background. If you try to find a piece of cold sky, there's always a little bit of hydrogen there and you'll get these little dips in the band. Uh, this provides a very nice way. I don't know how you would implement this on a larger dish, but on something this side, size, it's very easy to slip on and off, and it creates a, a good basic uh, background level that removes all electronic issues. Hardware 2 upgrade. This was an accident. Um, the original configuration, in fact, it's a variation on that now. I had about 15 feet of coax to the um, to the LNA, and then I immediately transitioned over from a to a, a USB to Ethernet extender over CAT cable, and that thing is nasty. Um, I tried all kinds of configurations on it. Um, it got to the point where one time last fall I bought some. I think it was 12 foot, 12 feet long, a four foot wide uh, aluminum screen, window screen. And, and I put a fence around this thing to try to shield the, the antenna from whatever RF. I thought it was coming from my neighbor's house. Didn't know where it was coming from. It, it got really bad. And neglecting this, this extension here, what I found was that the fence itself was reflecting in even more noise. The, and, and this may be self-inflicted in that um, this loop feed has a very wide angle of visibility. And with the original re, uh, reflector having an F to D ratio of 0.35, I may have had over illumination just by the design of the, uh, the feed point, um, whatever. I added extenders on here. These, the, 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 um, the feed is polarized. It only, it only receives in this axis. It's called vertical, but I'm not sure I know what that means when you put it on a parabolic dish. These, these, are intended to carry through with the parabolic shape. These aren't. These are set about 45 degrees. The only intent of these is to shield this from any kind of ground noise. And so I just played around putting mirrors on here and verified that that anything in above or around the area can't be seen by the um, feed point. And this is the difference. I probably should throw the orange away, but this is this is the noise level that I was receiving with the bare stock uh, Wi-Fi dish, and this is what happened when I added the side panels on to effectively create an antenna with an F to D ratio of 0.25. This has this is just the end panels. This has the short side panels, and the difference is pretty amazing. Um, what a huge improvement for about 30 or $40 of, of parts. So that is, that, that is there. Um, they are, they're, they're detachable so I can remove them when I stick the antenna in the trunk of the car. Um, but it really has enhanced the performance of this system. So I finally wound up giving up on trying to do anything else with this. Cat5 extender other than finally putting it in a cast aluminum box. And this is kind of like, and the kitchen sink. Um, this case is on plastic mounts. It's, it's ground is isolated. 
I put in a type 61 ferrite. Um, this is shielded cat five over here. It's cat seven shielded cable that comes out. Um, what else did I do? Uh, this is about 25 feet away. So I have, tw I, I went up with uh, 25 feet of coax and this being 25 feet away, I get no noise. I finally have solved the problem. I went through three different brands of these uh, Cat5 uh, USB extenders to find one that would work. And so the box, there's 12 volts in, 12 volts out to the antenna, uh, the LNA uh, on the antenna, the Tom Henderson hardware, a five volt DC to DC converter for the this uh, uh, USB to Cat5 extender, which powers the AirSpy Mini. This is a little bigger than it should have been. Initially, I tried putting in the um, no electric sawbird in here. Must be too much. Putting the sawbird afterwards, I wound up with all kinds of strain saturation. I, I played with enough that I just gave up. And so it works okay as it is and so close it up put some fan cooling on it this gets a little warm and so this works and so i have a system that i can set up and overcome a lot of initial issues so um taking a look at some of the data this is caused by doppler shift doppler shift from rotation of the galaxy and rotation of the earth and in its axis, around its axis, and also its orbital velocity, which took me a while to figure out. Wolfgang painfully exchanged the number of emails to help me understand what local standard of rest meant. Anyhow, um, there is there are some shifts correlated to the rotation of the galaxy associated with where, where the Earth is that causes decreases or increases in frequency related to the, the Doppler shifts. And the way you can correct that, well, let's say not correct that, the way you um, convert the frequency to velocity in order to correct it is through this equation. Um, to, to convert the frequency to a velocity you find this frequency shift fraction, which is the reference frequency of H1 minus the measured frequency divided by the measured frequency times the velocity of light. And so you can do this in Excel and you create a, you can calculate the Doppler shifted frequency in kilometers a second. So instead of plotting frequency, you can convert or plot converted velocity. And so your plots, you can change over and you can plot velocity. More analysis. Whoops, oops, oops, oops. Um, this was the last cool 24 hour clear day, nice weather this year. It was the end of March. And over a three day period, I acquired um, three, four samples of data. And I want I want to go through the analysis of this one particular eight hour chunk. And um, what I did was I took eight hours worth of data equated to 102 or three averages. And so every five minutes, every 1.25 degrees, I acquired a sample of data. And so I had 100, 101 of these over that time slice process this in MATLAB because the 120 samples, it would have been a monster to try to deal with in, in Excel. This is what the raw data look like. I'm still not sure of the source of this drift. It's, uh, this is raw sample data, so I don't even know what, what this level is, but it went from about uh, 5.7 to 6.2. So I don't know if this was temperature drift of the amplifier, whatever. What I did was I wrote a, uh, a software script that I said, okay, I want everything to be as quiet as the lowest level. I averaged 50 samples here and I corrected all the data. So I forced everything to 
and equated this to zero dB so that all of the data is, is relative to that point, away from any H1 variation. This should be cold sky background. So this is normalized, referenced to a, a common point. Now all I had was drift in frequency due to local standard of rest, the variation, the rotation of the, of the Earth and the position in which it's uh, pointing. And we'll go through this in a little bit more detail, but hopefully you can see these peaks are shifted where these are all pretty well aligned. Local standard of rest. Um, the big monster is the rotation of the Earth rotating in, the Earth rotating and rotating in and out of its orbital velocity. Its orbital velocity is about 30 kilometers per second, so you can vary between plus and minus 30 kilometers per second every day. And halfway around, you are perpendicular to that, and so you get zero. And so this is eight hour period over a 24 hour period, you are going to get this sinusoidal cycle, which combines it's primarily due to the rotation of the Earth, uh, the orbital velocity of the Earth, plus its rotation. And local standard of rest is the mean motion of material around in the vicinity of the Milky Way. So. I'm not moving. How is everything else moving relative to me? I'll show you how I got this. I found an online calculator that allows you to enter in the time, the date and time, the location in the sky, hour angle declination in which you are observing, and your location on Earth, and you can calculate the rotational velocity. And so over that eight hour period, I did this for eight different, eight or nine different times, and I entered these red values into Excel, and it came up, I used the second order curve thing, and it came up with this equation. So I used this in MATLAB to, cor to correct all the data. It's a little bit difficult to show, but over that eight hour period, the original drifted in frequency due to going in and out of Earth's rotation. And after correction, everything was pretty close. So this allowed me to, to create the second order equation. And that's what the data looks like corrected. So what this really looks like is corrected for local standard of reference is this redshift velocity. And so as I go through the Milky Way, I wound up with this spectrum. And what I wanted to show you, this probably makes more sense in that this was a, a velocity. Let's see, I guess that's a positive. That's a red shift down to a blue shift. So this, the amplitude correlates to the color. So over that eight hour period, I was use the Earth's axis is goes the Earth's axis is tilted 6 degrees to the, to the plane of the uh, Milky Way. And so over that time, you swing through the plane of the Milky Way. And that's what this is showing. This is showing above, through, and then on the other side of the Milky Way. And this correlating to a galactic uh, latitude, longitude of eight, around 80 degrees. And we're looking through the Perseus and outer arms. I presume that correlates to these frequencies. As an interesting check, I had corresponded with JJ Mantois, and he has a map on his website that looks like this, that covers the a large extent of the Milky Way. And I was amazed to find that this little one meter telescope had a very high correlation with what his spectrum, what he obtained with his 3.3 meter dish. And for looking at three different areas of the Milky Way, I just, it's just thrill, it's just amazing that I have been able to get this kind of data with a one meter telescope. So I am extremely pleased that this correlates so well. So anyhow, last August, this is what I started with. And now we're up to things that look like this.
and that's another plot of that uh, that slice through the Milky Way. So that's the that's the presentation. I don't know how to get back? Well, excellent. Um, I've got one question from Wolfgang. Uh, the ripple you have in your spectrum could it be reflections somewhere in your setup? RF reflections? I think he was looking at the uh, beginning of your talk. Uh, you had some ripples uh, you thought yes. were. Uh... Yeah, I know there's. Yeah. I, I What ref. Hold on. Yeah, I, um, you, you um, were assuming that it might be a ripple in the passband of the filter. Um, I, I'm just uh, considering that if you have reflection in your RF chain. That, that could also cause reflections. Uh, let's see. So I should be able to change the length of the coax and see them shift, right? That's right, yes. Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll... The reason why I'm asking is uh, we have measured the passband of these uh, NOLAC devices, and they seem to be pretty flat. Okay, none of this is with NOLAC, but but that's a real good – that's, that's another project. Yes, I can certainly see if that is uh, – if they're reflections, I'll just add some co add some. There's a, there's a lot of things that. Great. You else have any other questions? Stephanie, go ahead and uh, ask him. Oh. I don't hear anything. Uh, oh, so, oh, she didn't have a question. She had a good comment. Uh, and I was oh. gonna re I'm trying to figure out how to read the comment here. One second. Uh, not the end, the beginning. Thanks for showing a good place to start. Another good use of the equatorial mount. I do have. I have a question. I want to show. Um, Originally, I posted, I think, on Sarah. Well, I have this on my on the uh, QRZ website, and this is correct, and this is valid for this antenna. When I tried out of representation, that sender is full. I got a reflect clue station of it. Marcus was talking about patch antennas. This implementation of a patch antenna worked really well. And so I will probably put this up somewhere, but um it's the same five inch cake pan and the difference but and this looks about like that so that's a winner as far as ease of construction okay in your uh, in your implementation on that cake pan you cut that down to uh the the side walls of that cake pan down to 18 millimeters is that what you for the for the patch yeah see i okay the the original um the original loop feed uh scale off of om6aa's antenna was a depth i think 31 millimeters i've only i just started this this week we've had sahara sand in the sky I didn't know what that was going to do the background it's been crazy weather um the loop feed tuned with the the, the uh, patch only eight millimeters above the back surface. That's where everything tweaked out. So the 31 millimeter depth of the sides seemed to physically shield the, the antenna element from the perimeter of the one meter reflector. So I cut it down to 18. But that, so I, I, just, I just guessed at it. And but that last plot is with the sides 18. This is still, as soon as I, the weather gets a little better, I want to try to tweak this. But this definitely works. I mean, I, 
the fact that they came out that close, I, I was surprised. So that is a, that's a winner. That's a, but you know, it's about a $20 antenna. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions for Alex? Well, Alex, it's a super, uh, super project you got there and uh, you've really enhanced the uh, capability of, I think, this organization uh, with your uh, efforts there. So uh, great job. Thanks. And, uh, thanks, for the thanks. And the idea was I wasn't trying to be dollar limited. I was trying to put something together with with, you know, not outrageous functions, but that or not outrageous cost, but seeing how well, how far I could take this uh, this project with a one meter dish. All right. Thank you. Yeah.